All right, welcome back everybody for another video. Today, we're doing a style that I've really wanted to do for a long time, uh, but I've kind of shied away from because it's pretty difficult to do, uh, difficult to get right. I'm not even sure if I'm actually gonna get it right today, but we're gonna give it our best shot. Uh, it's also something I cannot find a lot of uh, examples of on YouTube. Uh, so hopefully this is something that becomes useful to people uh, who want to brew a Doppelbach, which is what we're doing today. So. Uh, Doppelbach is German for double Bach, which is, uh, well, a Bach literally just translates to strong. Bachs are uh, caramel colored, rather malty beers um, of, you know, five to six percent ABV, not really strong by today's standards. Uh, but a Doppelbach, on the other hand, is a very dark, rich, malty, uh, strong beer. It's going to be somewhere between like seven to nine percent ABV, which is really strong for a lager. Um, so hopefully this works out pretty well. It's just gonna be very difficult to brew because not only is it going to incorporate a two hour boil, it's also gonna incorporate a decoction mash. Um, and I will talk more on that later, but it's not necessary to decoction mash this beer. I'm just doing it because I like to punish myself, um, but also because I really enjoy decoction mashing. Uh, might be the same thing. Uh, and also it's gonna require about four times as much yeast as we normally pitch. So. Uh, there's a lot of different things going on in this beer uh, that are going to make it difficult, um, but we're going to give it our best shot. So, um, the Doppelbach came about because monks in uh, Bavaria uh, would fast for Lent, basically. And monks in Europe brewed a lot of beer for themselves, um, and they brewed this type of beer specifically to sustain themselves during their period of fasting during Lent. Uh, so these beers were considered liquid bread, um, essentially providing them the nutrients to stay alive, uh, but also probably to stay lit during the entire time of Lent. But basically, there's a lot of stuff going on in this. Uh, it's gonna be dark, malty, rich, very full of caramel color. Uh, should be a very clean lager. It's gonna take well over a month to actually lager this thing out completely. Uh, our recipe is going to be mostly Munich malt. Um, there's no Pilsner in this at all. We're using Munich as the base malt. Um, and that's fine because Munich malt has enough diastatic power to convert all the other malts. Um, and uh, we're using the largest yeast starter I've ever built also. <laughs> so anyway, here's our recipe. It's going to be 12 pounds of Munich type 1, or the light colored Munich malt and three pounds of Munich Dark. Um, I was gonna do 50-50, but uh, the homebrew store ran out of Munich Dark malt. Um, we're gonna add one pound of Cara Munich, half a pound of Melanoidin malt, and a quarter pound of Carafa II. Um, I'm adding that half a pound of Melanoidin malt because even though I'm doing a decoction mash to generate Melanoidins, I still think that there's a lot of richness in this beer that's gonna be complemented by a little tiny bit of melanoidin malt, so we'll see what that does. Hopefully that doesn't overdo it. Um, so that's like 16 and 3 quarter pounds of grain total. Um, for bittering, we're going to add 1.3 ounces, or 22 IBUs worth of pearl hops at 60 minutes. And then um, for yeast, I am using Y-Yeast 2206, the Bavarian Lager. Uh, now, I have made an incredibly large starter for this. Um, I only have a two liter flask, so I only had two liters of volume to work with. So normally these uh, require a four liter starter, uh, but I did three packages of uh, 100 billion cell count yeast uh, packages into a two liter starter with 1040 gravity. So hopefully that gets us somewhere around 500 billion cells, uh, which is what I calculated I need to uh, inoculate this beer properly with. It's uh, not only is it a lager, which requires double the normal pitch rate, but it's a strong lager, which requires double the lager pitch rate. So there you have it. Um, for water, uh, it's gonna be a multi-balance kind of profile. Uh, and I am working with my own city water, which does have its own limitations. So we have uh, 79 parts per million of calcium, 24 parts per million of magnesium, 83 parts per million of sodium, 83 parts per million of sulfate, 179 parts per million of chloride, and 123 parts per million of carbonate. Uh, everyone's own base water is going to be different, so calculate what you need in order to get a water profile that has a moderate level of calcium and magnesium, uh, preferably lower levels of sodium, 
and a sulfate to chloride ratio of about one half. So you want twice as much chloride as sulfate. And then also a decent amount of carbonate, but nothing more than 200 parts per million. Um, don't go ahead and use the Munich water profile, it's not really necessary. Um, I'll be adding six grams of Epsom and five grams of calcium chloride and two grams of chalk to my water in order to get that profile correct. So here's where things start to get very interesting and that is the mash. So uh, <laughs> we're doing a decoction mash like I said. Now this is going to be a hook carts style double decoction um, that I learned from Brau Kaiser. Uh, there's a website out there called Brau Kaiser. It's a blog. Um, breaks down the scientific part of decoction mashing really well for people who aren't familiar with how it works. Um, and it has some formulas on there to help you calculate your own decoctions. Uh, but anyway, I am starting out with 28 quarts of water and I'm going to dough in at 143 degrees Fahrenheit to reach our first mash rest, which is the protein rest, which will be 133 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 minutes. Uh, basically, the protein rest promotes a very good strong head on the beer, uh, but we don't want to leave it in that rest temperature for more than 15 to 20 minutes. At that point, I'm going to add water. It's going to be six quarts of boiling water, and this is going to raise the temperature of the mash to our first uh, sacrification rest, which is 145 Fahrenheit. Uh, 145 is dubbed the maltose rest. Basically, we're going to extract some fermentable sugars out of the grain. We're going to hold it at 145 for 90 minutes. However, once 30 minutes have elapsed, I'm going to start pulling decoctions. And I will, extract, I will explain to you how the decoction process works once I get to that step. Uh, but basically, we're going to decoct nine and a half quarts of thick mash. We're going to boil that for 30 minutes. That is going to cause a lot of formation of melanoidins and deep, rich, browning flavors. Uh, basically, the same exact reaction happens when you sear a steak on a cast iron pan. That's why uh, seared steaks and grilled steaks taste the way they do. Rich flavors come from this. So the same sort of thing is going on with the grain. Um, we're going to do that, boil it for 30 minutes, and then we're going to add that back into the mash. That will raise the temperature of the mash to 158. And at that point, um, I'm going to start the dextrinization rest, or the alpha sacrification rest. Essentially what that means is we're going to be focusing on creating long chains of dextrins, or unfermentable sugars. These add sweetness and body and mouthfeel to the beer um, and that is important for this style and we're going to hold it there for about 60 minutes um, and then we're going to do a second decoction of nine quarts of thick mash we'll boil that and uh, that's going to further promote melanoidins just like the first decoction did we'll add that in and that is going to raise us to the mash out temperature which is 168 fahrenheit we'll hold that for about 15 minutes that's going to denature all of the conversion enzymes uh, basically, that's going to make it easier for us to lauder or drain out all of the wort from the grain bed. It keeps getting interesting. Uh, we're going to collect the wort and we're going to do a two hour long boil, which is going to raise the original gravity by condensing the wort and it's going to promote deeper, richer flavors as well. Uh, which means that we need about nine and a half gallons of pre boil wort, uh, which is a gallon and a half more than usual. So uh, it's going to be a lot of sparging, I think. Uh, but do the best we can to make that work uh, and then at 10 minutes we'll do our standard whirl flock and uh, adding in yeast nutrient uh, and that should be it so hopefully this works out pretty well anyway i've added half a camden tablet to my mash water plus the brewing salts a while ago uh, and it has reached the strike temperature so let's go ahead and add in that grain all right so as i said earlier we reached our strike temperature of about 143 degrees so now i'm going to go ahead and dough in And the steam that you see is just from the uh, boiling water that's going to be part of our uh, infusion addition to raise us up to the second step. I just already have that going. Accidentally just poked a hole in the green bag. All right. Well, we're going to do this a different way than usual, I guess. This is gonna be a little bit thicker than my typical mash, uh, but basically just wanna stir it up real good, make sure we don't have any dough balls. The last time a decoction mashed was with a wheat-based grist, and that was, uh, that was a nightmare. 
This should be a little bit easier with just barley. <laughs> All right, so as you can see, um, kind of overshot the mash temperature a bit, so it's like 138. Well, it took a little bit of effort, but uh, we got the mash temperature down to where we want it, 133 degrees. So now I'm gonna start that 15 minute protein rest. All right, so uh, 15 minutes have elapsed. It's time to get our mash up to the next temperature. Yeah, we're gonna do that by infusing boiling water into uh, the mash. And I have this one quart dipper. It's gonna do that one quart at a time. Now, Beersmith says I'm supposed to do this uh, with six quarts of boiling water, uh, but we're just gonna add one or two in at a time, stir it up and see where we're at so that I don't, again, overshoot the temperature like I did last time. We've reached our second temperature step, uh, which is gonna be holding it at 145 degrees for 90 minutes. Uh, but because that's such a long period of time, I'm gonna go ahead and start setting up the recirculation system uh, so we can get that going. All right, so we're 45 minutes into the uh, first step of the mash, which is the 145 degree uh, maltose rest. But now we're gonna go ahead and take out uh, the first decoction. So I've been recirculating for a while to maintain that 145 degrees. Um, so now I'm gonna pause the recirculation and then start scooping out some mash. All right, so now what we wanna do is start scooping out thick mash. Uh, and by thick mash, I mean as much grain and as little liquid as possible. Uh, we still want a decent amount of liquid in there just to cover things up, but uh, this is more of the consistency that we're talking about here. So I am decocting nine quarts, nine or nine and a half quarts. Now back in the day, German brewers would use this technique to uh, control the temperature of their mash. Nowadays, we don't need to do that anymore because we have things like thermometers, but uh, because the temperature of boiling anything is uh, a constant temperature, roughly 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, the brewers back then were able to maintain uh, their temperatures and precisely change the mash. Uh, and they figured out over time that certain amounts of mash being boiled did certain things with the final beer. So over time, they were kind of able to deduce uh, how to make really good beer through this method. Uh, but it, we're kind of using it for the flavor compounds it's gonna generate. <laughs> All right, so this is what it should look like once you've uh, finished the, the decoction, um, or at least pulling the grain out. You want a little bit of liquid on top, but mostly grain in here. So. I'm gonna heat this on a stovetop burner and we're gonna do it uh, not at the highest setting because you don't wanna scorch the grain. Uh, and the most important thing about this right now is to basically constantly stir it as it's heating and as it's boiling. That way we keep grain off of the bottom and uh, we don't scorch it because scorched beer creates disgusting flavors. I know from experience. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to try and set up the recirculation again. So I just took a pH sample of the wort now, and it looks like it's a bit on the acidic side, so I'm going to add a tiny amount of baking soda just to raise the pH just a smidgen. Uh, hopefully we'll be fine. All right, so we've just hit the boiling point on our decoction here, so we're basically going to maintain stirring this for the next 30 minutes. Uh, this is going to cause, already I can see a decent amount of darkening in the grain. Um, but it's gonna cause a lot of good flavor compounds to develop. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction in the recipe section, um, I said I, you don't have to decoction mash this beer 
in order to get a decent result out of it. And I stand by that, though back in the day when decoction mashing was used, the malts were not even close to as uh, high quality as they are today. So that's why you can get away with a single infusion mash. So about 99% of beer out there doesn't require decoction mashing in order to be good, um, especially even during German lagers like this. Um, you can get away with a single infusion mash at 152 degrees with uh, 5 to 8% melanoid and malt to replicate the decoction flavors and you will do just fine. Um, you could also do the same thing with a step mash. You could hit the uh, same exact temperature points that I'm doing here in the mash, um, but without the decoction, just adding boiling water or direct heat to the mash. So you really don't have to do this. This is just kind of a nod to tradition for me. And it's just a way for me to feel a little bit more connected with the beer, which is just something I like to do. So. We're going to keep this up for the next 30 minutes or so, and then we'll start adding it back in. Okay, so uh, we just about finished our 30 minutes on the decoction boil. So I'm going to go ahead and shut that heat off now and uh, pull the pot off of the heat so it doesn't have uh, a risk of scorching to the bottom while I pull the decoction. So here's the tricky part now. Well, this whole thing's tricky, but Here's another tricky part. We're gonna to need to add in this decoction back into the main mash and hit our temperature as precisely as possible. So the first thing we gotta do is shut off the recirculation here. Now, what we need to do is basically add this decoction back in one scoop at a time. And as you can see, um, hopefully it's pretty apparent from the change in time the uh, color is turned into a really nice dark brown and the consistency is totally different. It's now very, uh, you can't even tell that that was originally green. It's just smashed up beyond recognition, which is what happens when you boil it. So I'm gonna add about three or four scoops back in and then we'll mix it up real good. And uh, check our temperature. Now we're shooting for a target temperature of 158 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for this next step. So you don't wanna go over that. And there's a good chance that we pulled enough decoction to actually bring us over that temperature. So that's why you wanna add it in gradually, making sure that you stir it up real well. Now keep in mind also that since I'm not boiling the decoction anymore, it's also losing heat. So it uh, will eventually cool down to the mash temperature and that's when we'll add the rest of it in if we end up uh, not needing to add all of it. All right, we're at 156. All right, I'm gonna add one last scoop in and then we'll start the recirculation. And at that point, I will let the rest of the decoction cool off to the mash temperature before adding it back in. All right, so I uh, ended up not having to actually add all the decoction back in to get the temperature, which is what we want to happen. Uh, so anyway, I just set up the recirculation to start working out, uh, keeping that temperature consistent for the next 60 minutes. I'm gonna start that timer now. And uh, once this is cooled down, we'll add it right back in. All right, so now it's time for decoction number two, um, the uh, dextrinization or alpha sacrification rest our next step at 158 degrees has been sitting there for about 15 minutes, uh, which leaves us 45 minutes left in the step, which is the time that we have to uh, do our last decoction here. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the pump temporarily and scoop out the grain just like we did last time. Uh, and we're just gonna follow the exact same procedures. Just scoop out the grain that we need, which is nine quarts, boil it and consistently stir it, never walk away from it. And we'll do that for 30 minutes.
All right, so uh, we just finished up the boiling portion of the second and final decoction. So now I'm gonna go ahead and shut off the heat and start adding it back in. Um, now, this one's a little different than the first one because we're shooting to get to our mash out temperature of 168. So it doesn't really matter if we overshoot that temperature because mash out occurs from that temperature and higher. Uh, however, we just wanna stay below 180 because we don't wanna to extract too many tannins uh, from all of this grain. So I'm gonna go ahead and start adding all of that stuff back in now. Looks like we hit our mash out temperature, so I'm just gonna hold that temperature for uh, the next 15, 20 minutes, and uh, then we'll go ahead and start uh, figuring out how to lauder. All right, so now uh, it is time for us to start collecting what we can from the, uh, the wort here. So now it's real simple. Um, we're just gonna go ahead and take this valve and open it. And then the pump is open and on. We turn this valve on and then we'll turn our pump on. And we'll start to collect as much wood as we can. All right, so now uh, we're gonna wanna start sparging, and the way I'm doing this is what I usually do, which is batch sparging. Uh, so I have several gallons worth of 170 degree water here, so I'm gonna go ahead and spoon that over the uh, grain bed. All right, so I don't normally batch sparge twice. Usually I'm good to go with one, but this is such a high gravity wort that um, I actually was okay batch sparging twice. And that's also because I need a full nine and a half gallons pre-boil because of that two hour boil. So uh, it ended up being uh, a little bit more work than usual on the sparge, but we got enough wort and it's at an appropriate gravity, I think. So you know, we're gonna go ahead now and get things started. I'm gonna clean out the boil kettle and probably clean my stove off a bit and then uh, We'll fill up the boil kettle and get to it. All right, so for our pre-boil gravity, it looks like we've got about 13 bricks, uh, which is a little low compared to what I was hoping it would be with all the decoction mashing, but uh, that's all right. Um, but that translates to about 1051 for a pre-boil gravity. Now with a two hour boil, I'm hoping we can get about 20 gravity points onto this, so that would be great. All right, so this is a two hour boil, so we just hit it and uh, well, we're gonna do nothing. So we'll come back in 60 minutes and we'll add our hops then. Okay, so uh, we've been boiling for an hour now, so it's time to add our 60 minute hop addition, which is the uh, 1.3 ounces of parl. So I'm gonna go put those in the hop spider. It didn't all come out, apparently. We're gonna sit here and wait for another while because 
we have another 60 minutes left in the boil, but uh, 10 minutes before the end of the boil, I'm gonna come back and add some stuff. So uh, we'll wait for another 50, five zero minutes. We are now 10 minutes from the end of the boil. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and add a Whirlflock tablet in, and that's gonna help promote clarity in the beer, at least in the final beer. I'm gonna let that sit in there and dissolve. And then I'm gonna add some uh, yeast nutrient here which is gonna be critical for this beer because it's so dependent on the yeast health. So that's two and a half tablespoons, or sorry, that's two and a half teaspoons. And it's about a half teaspoon, all right, good, all right. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and start to uh, put together the chilling system. I have my plate chiller and an output thermometer. All right, so in the last 10 minutes of the boil here, I'm gonna go ahead and recirculate boiling wort through the chiller. So what this is gonna do is gonna sanitize the inside of the pump and the chiller and it's gonna recirculate through, um, which is basically going to encourage all of the crap that falls out of the boil to coagulate in the center, um, as well as the obviously perform that sanitation. So we got a good sight glass here. It shows me the picture of, uh, it shows me a, a good idea of what the work color is gonna be. It looks like a really nice kind of medium brown. Um, so that's nice. We'll just run here for another 10 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll come back and we'll start chilling. All right, well, the boil's done, so it's time to shut off all the heat. Now I'll start taking the first cooling uh, water that comes out from the chiller and use it to create a uh, sanitizer solution in the fermenter. So, all right, well, now we're just gonna wait for the uh, output temperature of the, the wort out to uh, settle down to Oh, somewhere around ale temperatures for pitching. I'm not gonna pitch yeast tonight. Um, what I'm gonna do is cool it off to 70 or lower and then toss it in my fermentation fridge for a while. Uh, and I'll pitch the yeast tomorrow morning, uh, but I'm still gonna do a double round of aeration. Uh, gonna aerate pretty heavily tonight and then I'm also gonna aerate a lot in the morning tomorrow when I pitch the yeast. But um, or as you saw earlier, there's a giant two liter starter that I'm using for my yeast and uh, I'm not pitching all of that junk wort that's on top, so I'm gonna decant that, put it in the fridge overnight, let all the yeast drop down to the bottom, um, and we'll pour off some of that liquid in the morning. Okay, so we have an OG of about 19.8 uh, bricks, uh, and that translates with my refractometer to a gravity of about 1.079, so that's a very, very high OG. Um, and makes for an excellent potential for a very strong beer. All right, so we got the wort down to about 70 degrees. Uh, so that is not good enough for pitching yeast, but it is good enough for putting it into the fermenter. I'm gonna leave it in the fermentation chamber overnight, and in uh, that course of time, it should cool down to the pitching temperature of about 45 to 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So what I'm doing right now is heavily oxygenating the wort by splashing it uh, into the fermenter here aggressively. Um, this is gonna diffuse a lot of oxygen into the wort, which is gonna help the yeast uh, grow and multiply during those first few days of fermentation, which are so important. However, uh, since I'm not actually pitching the yeast tonight, I am gonna go ahead and actually oxygenate again tomorrow with um, a slotted spoon or some other stirring element uh, in the fermenter tomorrow. But in the meantime, this is going to be enough um, for tonight. I'm not gonna pitch it, like I said, I'm gonna do that in the morning. Overnight, I'm gonna take that two liter starter and I'm gonna stick it in the fridge and I'm gonna allow the yeast to drop out of suspension and then I'm gonna decant the, uh, the nasty wort that actually uh, it's fermented in this whole time um, and then we'll pitch just the yeast, but I'll show you that tomorrow morning. Fermentation for this beer is gonna be a little bit difficult, so uh, it is a lager <laughs> um, and not only is it a lager, it's a strong lager, so it needs as much oxygen as you can give it so yes, we're pitching four times the usual amount of yeast and um, as much oxygen as we can give it. We're gonna ferment it for two to three weeks at about 
45 to 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And then I'm going to figure out a way to amp the temperature up just a little tiny bit every single day, probably like one degree Fahrenheit every single day. Um, and this is gonna encourage better attenuation and uh, cleaner tasting beer at the end of the day. After two or three weeks have elapsed, I'm gonna go ahead and take it out for a diacetyl rest, which is gonna be bringing it up to room temperature for two to three days to clean up the off flavor known as diacetyl. Um, after that point, we're gonna go ahead and keg it and then I'm gonna lager it in the keg uh, for at least a month, maybe longer, maybe two months. Um, it's a very strong beer, probably gonna be near 8% ABV based on that uh, original gravity. So it's important that we uh, give it a long lagering period to reach its full potential before drinking it. The good news is, if it does reach that full potential after two months, it will be ready just in time for the spring melt. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and cap this thing up and stick it in my fermentation fridge. All right, so it's the next morning now, and uh, I have let the wort sit inside the fermenter overnight in the chamber to cool down to about 45 degrees. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and aerate once more with this uh, sanitized slotted spoon. Okay, now we've got a good inch of foam or so on the surface there, um, so that should be enough oxygen, I think in combination with all the stuff I put in last night. Uh, so now we're gonna go ahead and pitch the yeast. I decanted the starter after leaving it overnight in the fridge. So it's mostly yeast cells in there and not just uh, starter work. Go ahead and pour all that in. All right, so the diacetyl rest is completed on the Doppelbach and here we have our final gravity and it's about 1020. Um, it's at room temperature, so it looks like it's a bit lower, but it is 1020 with temperature correction. So we're gonna go ahead and keg this tonight, and then uh, we're gonna lager it in the keg for at least a month or so. So I will update the video when that happens. All right, so it has officially been three months, nearly to the day, that I have been lagering this Doppelbach, and this week I've noticed a huge change in its flavor. I've kind of been monitoring it slowly over the course of the last several weeks and just trying to see uh, how the flavor was changing. And right now, most of the yeast-based flavors have dropped out completely. I think we have finally gotten that really nice, rich, malty character that we want out of Doppelbach. So I think I am comfortable uh, serving it in front of you guys today and critiquing it. So basically fermentation for the beer after primary was complete at you know the mid 40s. I took it out and did a diacetyl rest on it, brought it up to room temperature for a while actually um, to make sure that we were clean, uh, free of diacetyl and uh, happy to go forward uh, into the lagering process. Like, I kept the beer in my keezer at 31 to 33 degrees just around the water freezing mark, uh, just to be sure that uh, we were able to lager it out effectively. And as of last week, it started looking real nice and tasting even nicer, so I think it's ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour that for you now. Okay, so the uh, beer is called the Pontificator. Uh, it comes in at about 8% ABV and uh, 24 IBUs. The naming convention on this beer is actually a pretty interesting story. Typically the names on Doppelbox have always ended in the letters A-T-O-R. Uh, and that is actually paying homage to the original Doppelbach, which is the Polaner Salvator. Uh, so the monks uh, that actually initially brewed the Doppelbach style beer were from the Polaner Monastery, which also ended up becoming the Polaner Brewery that we know today from Germany. But their Salvator or Salvator beer is actually the original Doppelbach. So most Doppelbachs that have been brewed ever since have uh, always followed that naming convention. So think about like the Eyinger Celebrator is a pretty common one. And then there's also Troganator from Trogs Brewing Company. And you know, the list goes on. But that's pretty much where the idea for the uh, Pontificator came from. So. Uh, it is definitely making me pontificate because um, I have been 
already talking a lot. Okay, so as you can see, the appearance of the beer, it looks brown on the outside, but in fact, it is actually just a very dark red, very similar to a Belgian quadruple. If you can see, I have tried to put the light behind the beer in this in this clip here and show you kind of the dark red quality of it. But in most lighting circumstances, this is just gonna look very brown. The head on the beer is actually a very nice kind of off-white sort of creamy color. Not quite tan, but definitely not quite white either. It uh, is persistent for the first couple minutes and then seems to fade, uh, although it does leave a decent amount of lacing behind. <laughs> so now we'll move on to aroma. So the aroma is actually very strong of a dark raisin and a dark bread crust. There is no hop aroma. That's very important. Uh, but I also don't really get very much of the toasted molasses kind of character you would expect out of a uh, out of a Doppelbach. But you can definitely smell the sweet alcohol kind of um, if that makes any sense. It's not like a, a fusel kind of smell, it's just a sweet alcohol smell. Something like you would get out of, uh, I mean, most most strong dark beers tend to have this characteristic, Belgian quads and Russian Imperial Stouts. You take a whiff and you could realize this is gonna be a pretty strong beer when you take a sip of it. This is 8%. All right, so next up, we're gonna talk about mouthfeel. Hmm. So I ended up actually uh, a little bit under carbonating this on purpose because I think it is a beer that is a sipping beer and should not really be particularly effervescent. Um, this is a dessert beer kind of in the same way and a Russian Imperial Stout is a dessert beer. Um, and I think that under carbonation actually allows for a lot more of the malty character to come through uh, and not be masked by serious carbonation, um, which can sometimes actually lend a false sense of dryness to the beer. This is actually coming through as a very nice, uh, full, full-bodied beer. It is rich. It has a very clean characteristic to it. Um, it is not super slick, but there's a little bit of slickness there. Um, and that's because there is actually a little bit of diacetyl in this. And diacetyl is produced naturally by lager yeasts, and it's just always going to be a part of those beers but it tends to lend a little bit of a characteristic to the German beers in particular. Um, diacetyl is not a fault in this beer. All right so now we're going to go on to the great part which is flavor. So let me preface this by saying this is an incredibly malt forward rich beer that is full of a tremendous amount of different flavors which will change depending on temperature and depending on how long it's been since you took your last sip. Immediately, this actually comes across as balanced. It's not overly sweet at the beginning, but it's also not overly bitter. I think there's a good balance between hot bitterness and malty characteristic of this beer uh, right now. It is not too much in either direction. Uh, that initial balance does kind of fade, and you get much more of the malt on the back half, but that's where it's less aggressive. It's not sickly sweet, which is important for this style. You really don't want a Doppelbach that has um, an immediately sweet uh, cough syrup kind of cherry character or an overpowering caramel character. Both of those are undesirable. So we start with a kind of a dark fruit type of note, uh, which is I think closer to raisin or plum than anything else. Uh, it's really quite complex and I, I like that. It's not a cherry or a raspberry um, kind of yeast ester generated fruitiness. Um, although I think it might come from the yeast. I think a lot of it actually does come from the caramel um, malts. So after the dark fruit, uh, you know, after the dark raisin and plum kind of character, there is a really significant toasted caramel kind of note that comes through. But after the dark fruit and the toasted caramel, we kind of end up in this territory where we have a very significant, deep, rich, dark molasses character, uh, which is the reason why I love Doppelbox and the reason why I wanted to brew this. And uh, it's definitely up for debate, but I'm going to go ahead and say that I think that this might be the result of doing that decoction mash that I did earlier. Um, that is, I've used melanoidin malt plenty of times in the past and I've never gotten as rich of a, of a molasses character as I'm getting in this beer right now. And the uh, biggest variable I think that I put into this whole process was the decoction mash. Now this is definitely up for debate and I'm going to talk more on that later. 
Uh, but for now, just know that this is quite a solid uh, molasses flavor in here, and it's really, really enjoyable. And then last but certainly not least, the final layer of character and flavor of this beer is a significant bread crust. It's uh, very similar to a Munich Dunkel. Uh, it's got just kind of that dark bread crust that, uh, kind of like a toasty uh, character that you would see in most other dark German lager type beers. Um, and it's pleasant. It sticks around for a while and it is the primary aftertaste. Uh, the finishing gravity on this beer was pretty high so it does end up having a significant aftertaste for a while. And that's great because it's very pleasant. Um, it is a sipping beer, it's an after dinner beer, it's, you know, it's meant to, uh, <laughs> to be liquid bread, so uh, it's only appropriate that it has some bread crust characteristics. Uh, so I did force carbonate this last night and I'm kind of noticing it's, it looks flat now. Um, there's actually still a little bit of carbonation left in it, but uh, <laughs> I think I do need to carbonate this a bit more. Um, but I was really excited to share it with you guys, so pardon me for having this be like a flat looking beer. Uh, but it is carbonated, trust me. So for an overall rating, I guess I'm going to probably give this something healthy. I think it's really going to be uh, a 9. I think I'm going to give this a full 9. It's very, very good. Initially, this beer was kind of sweet, and it had a cherry taste to it that I was not a fan of. It was a very sickly sweet kind of character um, that I was not a fan of, and I really honestly thought that I might have ruined the beer. Um, I was pretty scared for the success of it, but here I am three full months later, and let me tell you that patience pays off. Um, the longer I let this thing sit and lager, the better. So that only goes to say that the more I let this lager into the future now, uh, it's actually going to end up being even, even better. Uh, so if I can maybe keep this keg alive over the next couple of months and only, only tap the Doppelbach when I really want one, um, I think this is gonna continue to be really, really nice and just continue to evolve and uh, just bring out new characteristics. Uh, so I'm pretty happy and I'm, uh, let me say I'm a huge fan of cold storage. As far as what I could have done to improve this beer, uh, it's kinda hard to tell right now. The biggest drawback that I'm seeing right now is just simply a lack of head retention. Um, and that has to do partially with me not carbonating the keg as much as I usually do. But overall, I'm really happy with the results and it's hard to take away points from this. I think in the future I can probably get away with doing a standard decoction mash and not adding melanoid malt. I think that probably might have contributed to that initial cherry character that I was getting, uh, but at the same time, that has faded. But if I'm patient enough to do this again, I guess it, it would be worth it. There were a significant portion of specialty malts in the recipe. I know there's a couple articles out there online that say that you can do a Doppelbach brewing with 100% Munich malt and no specialty grains. And I totally believe that. Maybe one day I'll do that. Um, but I really like the result that I got by adding a little bit of Cara Munich and a little bit of Melanoid and etc. As far as the yeast selection goes, I couldn't be happier. Um, it dropped out pretty much crystal clear. Uh, well, I mean, it's dark beer, so it's kind of like hard to tell that, but uh, it did drop out, and uh, there was you know, a minimal diacetyl character. But the starter that I used uh, was a sufficient cell count to get this thing down uh, to an appropriate gravity, and uh, we didn't really have any off flavors. There's no fusel alcohols from this. There's no, besides the, you know, allowable amount of diacetyl, there's no real other off flavors, so I'm pretty happy with it. Um, there's really not that much I would change. I think I would just go with that. I think what I'm going to change is I'm going to do another Doppelbach in the future and I'm going to try it using that 100% Munich malt method and just, just for the sake of experimentation, see what happens, you know? I'm sure plenty of you are curious about what that would taste like compared to a version that has specialty malts in it. I'll try to keep everything else the same. Maybe next year, that's something we'll do. So there's obviously a uh, huge huge debate out there amongst the homebrewing community about the relevance of decoction mashing. I had gone into it at the beginning of this video, so I'm not going to say it twice, uh, but my personal view on it, since I've done it a couple times, I think it is a really great process that connects me personally to the beer that I'm brewing uh, in a way that other mashing techniques simply don't because I'm consistently working with it and I'm consistently involved in it and it makes me feel like I'm really kind of instrumental to the uh, output of the beer based on my constant involvement in the brewing process. Uh, that being said, it is a ton of work and the results may vary. It's ultimately going to be up to you, the individual brewer, as to whether or not you think this is going to be worth it. Uh, so 
I had fun with it, but it's not something I'm going to do every single brew, hell no. But in certain beer styles, I really do think it, it definitely brings on additional character. And this is definitely one of those styles. The Hefeweizen that I made is it's debatable whether or not it came through on that one. Uh, but the Doppelblack, I really do feel like this was one of those beer styles that it really made a big difference for me in. Like I said, I think that's what gets that really dark molasses character that I'm looking for. And it goes perfect in a beer like this. So hardest brew day I've ever done by far. Second hardest fermentation I think that I've done. Um, but overall, ladies and gentlemen, this was well worth it. Uh, I, I know that this is a difficult and somewhat unapproachable style for some people. I think it can be intimidating, whether it's the decoction or the amount of time involved or the difficulty of the beer as told to you by other people, but I don't care. Regardless of that, I highly encourage you just to try it. I don't care if you're intimidated by decoction mashing or any other characteristics of this beer style, just, just go for it. I think you'll be happy that you did try it though as well. And that being said, a very important note, and I wanna echo something I said at the beginning of the video, it is not required that you need to do decoction mashing to make this beer. You can do it with a significant portion of melanotin malt, just add more than I did, and you will be happy with the results. So let me know what your thoughts are. Comment down below if you think the coction mashing is stupid and irrelevant because of today's malts. And truth be told, today's malts are awesome. Um, or if you enjoy doing it because it is a traditional method and connects you to your beer and maybe produces different results. Let me know regardless. I love to talk to you guys about all this stuff. I am kind of a neutral party when it comes to this thing. I can go either way. All that matters is that everybody here stays civil and we have good discussions about homebrewing because it is one of the best hobbies that we can go through right now. So you made it to the end of the video and I really appreciate you sticking around. This is definitely going to be a long one. I will cut it down as much as I can, but there is a lot to cover. Uh, but I really appreciate you if you stick around for so long. All right, so if you really enjoyed this video, please give it a like. It helps a lot. It helps my channel become more relevant to the YouTube community and helps me get discovered by other people. And if you like this stuff, please subscribe. It makes a big difference to me. So if you want to talk about things, please, I encourage you to comment down below. I do my best to read every single comment and respond to as many as I can. I tend to upload a new video to YouTube roughly every one to two weeks, roughly about as much as I can brew and uh, get kegs emptied to put new beer into them. But if you want more frequent updates, please feel free to follow me on Instagram. It's at the apartment brewer. You should see it pop up down below. And there I'll post roughly every two to three days uh, where I'm going to be, you know, talking about things that are actually happening in real time. So you can get informed on what kinds of brews are coming to the YouTube channel in the future and uh, you can keep up to uh, with my day to day brewing adventures. Uh, so down below in the description box, you'll find a complete recipe for this beer to include all the special mash steps that I went through earlier in the uh, video. So you'll find that hopefully useful. And uh, if you want to brew this beer for yourself, that is there for your enjoyment. Also, you'll see a complete list of the equipment that I use to brew as of the time of filming this video and links to Amazon where you can purchase it for yourself if you wish to. Uh, just be advised that if you do click on one of those links and purchase something, I earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you. And uh, frankly, it's a great way to support the channel if you want to do so. I appreciate all of it regardless. So thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. If you're still here, I appreciate you. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this lovely Doppelbach uh, over the course of the evening, and I will catch you in the next one. So, till then, cheers.